Ticker, investing in a better future for yourself and the world. I came across Ticker on Instagram when they mentioned how you can invest your money making a financial return whilst doing good. Ticket is an app that allows you to invest in a broad range of assets that are hand-selected and categorised into their four impact portfolios – climate change, disruptive technology, equality and a combination of each of these. Naturally, being interested in fintech and startups and, and looking at their product and thinking it was pretty cool, I found myself intrigued behind the story of Ticker. So I went along to one of their community events and met Tom, the investment manager and co-founder. After a quick chat, we scheduled a time to talk about the journey so far and the future of Ticker. Enjoy. Okay, welcome back to the Beta Podcast. I am joined here with Tom, and I'm not going to butcher your last name. <laughs> How do you pruddy your last name? <laughs> McGillicuddy. You've just got to say like every letter. <laughs> Mc- fl- Mc- flow McGillicuddy. Where's there that from? Um, Killarney in Ireland. My dad's side of the family are Irish. So. Oh, wow. yeah, it's, but it's even it's a rare name, even for that yeah. part of Ireland, you know, even for Ireland. So yeah. um, there's not that many McGillicuddies. And if there is another one, we're likely to be related. So yeah. you know, give me a shout. <laughs> so just hit us up. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So yeah. Tom is the co-founder of Ticker, which is a social investment app, mm-hmm. or in, is, it, in, is it classified impact, as impact yeah, investment? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, well, so we can go impact. into that a little. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, we'll start off there. So let's start off with the sort of elevator pitch for Ticker. Yeah. So it's an um, impact investment app designed for first-time investors, um, enabling anyone, whether you've got any experience or not, in investing mm-hmm. to invest in companies that are addressing some kind of social or environmental. Yeah. Um, problem um, and we give a lot of financial education in the app and impact reporting which is basically just reporting the good stuff that the companies you're investing in mm-hmm. are doing around the world so it's really for you know 80% of our users have never invested before that's yeah. kind of our market we still have a lot of people who have invested before using it because it's still the most convenient way for them to access these yeah. kinds of investments but predominantly we're designing it for the younger generation, millennial generation, um, mm-hmm. who've never invested before, and that's you know ninety something percent millennials have yeah. it. So that's the market. Cool, and um, um, we'll dive into this later on. Yeah. Uh, but the way I usually do these is we just kind of dive into your story first. So let's, go for it. let's talk about. So where did you grow up? What was school like? <laughs> let's go. <laughs> I was born in. Uh, oh my god, I feel like so. I was uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Wigan, in Greater yeah. Manchester. Um, so I was the you know first person in my family to go to university. Yeah. Moved to London, work in finance, that kind of thing. I um, but you know, I, I had a, I actually, I had a, I had a fantastic upbringing because I think growing up in like a working class northern town mm-hmm. can prepare you for any social situation. <laughs> nice. So um, and I had some great teachers, great parents, um, that that enabled me to go to college and then go to university and then yeah. inspired me to, um, apply for Barclays Graduate Scheme, which nice. I got on, um, and then started working in finance. And yeah. at that point, realised I didn't know any a single thing and had a steep learning curve <laughs> to come up. But so, yeah. so what was the interest in in investing in finance particularly? I had zero interest in it. Yeah, and um, I would say. I mean, I'll be honest for me, so when I, I studied accounting and finance and when I started it was money, like I wanted a better life for myself and that path was, for me was... Yeah, so there's, it's, a good, it's a good observation, it's similar, so when I was 16, my mum always reminds me of things that I've said in the past, so I'm always, yeah. I've got high conviction of whatever I believe in at the time, so when I was 16 I said I'm not going to college, Yeah. I'm going to get a trade, because all my friends were going to get in trades, you know, electricians, plumbers, or Actually, they're going to do yeah. something vocational, I was like, I want to go and earn some money. Um, I don't want to go to college and then I got convinced by my dad to go to college and I was like well I'm not going to university and I'm I'm not never working in finance and I'm never moving to London yeah. and all of those things <laughs> kind of happened and my mom always reminds me of, of those things but the, the simple thought process in my brain was I, I did politics and criminology at university mm-hmm. purely because I actually went to do English literature at Lancaster University you have, to, you have to choose a bunch of different subjects in your first year yeah. and I realised that after that first year I actually preferred the other ones not English literature right. yeah, yeah. Um, for whatever reason because it was more practical application in the real world mm-hmm. I was always very um, interested in politics even as a child in, in a, and at home my mum and dad we all talk about politics at that kind of dinner table yeah. which is very engaged in that kind of stuff so and then I found criminology just interesting because you know studying why people commit crime and the responses to it I just found engaging I had an amazing tutor at university and that's probably why I did yeah. well and then I came out and I was like, right, now I will think about what I want to do with the rest of my life. And the idea I had was to go and work in the criminal intelligence services. So um, MI5, the Secret Service, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but a lot of funding, I graduated in 2009, a lot of the funding for those positions were cut because of the financial crisis. So I went and worked at Barclays in Manchester doing some kind of like relationship support role. Yeah. And the idea was that I just saved money for 12 months, then me and my my four best friends from university were going to go and travel around South America for like six months. And then as I got to that end of that 12 months, I was like, 
and what am I going to do when I come back from this? So yeah. I I thought I'm in Barclays. Um, they know me. I'm doing you know I have a decent reputation in the small little area that I'm in. Mm-hmm. Let's see if I can find some people to speak with about the graduate schemes that are yeah. on offer, like in the investment bank in the in the investment division. So you were um, networking in terms. So I was networking. I was like, what was important to me then was you know still in my my young brain was a career progression and some yeah. some money. I didn't really care about finance. I didn't really mm. care about what the career was. I just wanted a what I saw as like a career without a ceiling. That's all I wanted. Yeah. So I didn't want to enter a world where I thought my salary would be capped by yeah. something or that there was a, there was a dead end quite quick. I was going to hit that, that yeah. ceiling and it, that's it. So it was like yeah. finance seems like, you know, um, an area that I'd get into. It seems interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't really personally care about it at this point in time. I was like, there's a career for me here. So I uh, wheedled my way onto that graduate scheme. The, 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 the day of the assessment center, the day after that, I flew to Rio, traveling with my mates in January. I found out when I was in Brazil that I got on the graduate scheme and it started like the month after I got back from yeah. South America. So it all worked out. out as well. So, oh, it was a, <laughs> and we got a sign-on bonus when we were in um, Brazil. <laughs> oh, right. It wasn't spent very well, I tell you. We had, we had a good few weeks on that. Um, but, and then I started. Mm-hmm. And um, when I started in, and we started to talk about this in our events, when I started in the industry, I was, I was definitely, of the 50 intake that year, I was clearly the, the, the most stupid. That is not false like modesty. I'm not modest as a person. Yeah. That is a clear assessment of what was going on. And we had to pass these initial exams mm. in the first two weeks that would enable us to A, start the graduate scheme, yeah. and then B, start the CFA, which is basically the big yeah, behemoth the, um, qualification that through. everyone goes through, but not that many people get through. Mm. And um there was like five people out of the 50 that failed the IMC and I was one of them. Mm. And they were like, right, you've got one more chance to pass it or you're off the graduate scheme before it starts. So I rang my mum. It's like, mum, I'm out of my depth. What are we going to do? And yeah. uh, anyway, got to the second point. But in order to get to the second point, my mum said, why don't you hire a tutor to come to the flat that I was living in in Canary Wharf that Barclays had put Matt and me in, Matt, the founder of the business. Yeah. So while he passed, so while he was out getting drunk every night after the IMC, <laughs> I had a tutor come around and I was going through all these um, different exam techniques, but he was the first person that ever taught me um, investment um, calculations and whatever in yeah. a non-financial way. Because I'm a non-financial brain, but it doesn't mean that I can't learn it. Yeah. So he taught me how to make it real world to me. Mm-hmm. And it kind of like something clicked. Like I remember the moment he was giving me this, he was teaching me how to uh, think about derivatives using yeah. uh, mugs and bottles of water on the, on the table. Yeah. And it was like a light went off on my brain. I smashed the exam, then I smashed through the CFA the years after that. Yeah. And there wasn't that many people on the graduate scheme that, that actually got through all three levels of the CFA. Mm. So I was maybe one of five, ultimately, that did that. And is, is that how you carried on learning going forward then? So yeah. He was like, so he, he, I had a, so a couple of things. I don't want to go into the full life story. Kind <laughs> no, of, of course. But when I was 16, I had an amazing English literature teacher, mm-hmm. which taught, and he taught me intellectual curiosity. I didn't have it at that point. What I had was uh, the ability to work hard and learn. Yeah. That's what my mum and dad taught me. But he taught me... Um, just poking around and like finding stuff Curiosity. out and digging and digging and digging and then when that tutor did what he did for me um, for that exam at Barclays I was like there's a process to learn it started to make me think there's a process to almost achieving anything so at that point I started applying it to different things in my life so I went and did an Ironman a couple of years after that because I'd never done endurance before I'd always lifted weights and played football that yeah. was my that was and I thought endurance not endurance isn't for me because I'm not built like that yeah. or whatever but I was like I wonder if this is just like a learning thing so I just structured my time efficiently learned the different disciplines and then I did the Ironman yeah. and I was like okay it's like another notch in the in the kind of um, exploration of what you can actually learn if you pick things apart and you reframe it in a way that you can understand. So that's why we care so much at Ticker about financial education because what I realized when I got into that graduate scheme and I couldn't work out a percentage on a calculator on the first day on a Barclays investment graduate scheme wasn't that I was stupid. I I hadn't been given the education that would make me feel informed. And then we spent our lives working in finance, Matt and me, and we realized that a bunch of the stuff that we learned yeah. was A, simple, and B, everyone should uh, deserves to know it for their own future. Mm. So, um, so so let's go back to... I was, ram- you, I was rambling. No, no, it's, it's good to hear these stories and people can mm. really resonate because there's going to be people listening to this that, again, they can't think that same way like in terms yeah. of... I mean, I did a derivatives module at Union. God, yeah, it, yeah, it's dense. confusing. So, yeah. But l- let's go back to... like going back to your career so you come mm. out of uni you've got your grad scheme you've been traveling in yeah. in brazil yeah. and south america um what were those few years like 
in investment management. Yeah, yeah, F- uh, fascinating. I mean, no, genuine, genuinely, I think what again it was t- tied to the intellectual curiosity. Why I love finance, and I still do, and I loved it even more back then, was um, it's really like you, you understand politics, economics, behavioral fi- behavioral science, sociology, all wrapped in one, and you basically get given context for how the world actually works. Yeah, capital markets is how the world works. Yeah, so if you can understand that, you you feel like you get what's going on everywhere. Everything's really about money and incentives, yeah. and finance and investment gives you the, the you know that knowledge. Mm. So learning that was fascinating. It was like. Such a steep learning curve for me. I never. I felt like I was constantly you know, battling against just drowning you know, for like two or three years. Yeah. But the more you, the more we learned, Matt and I, the more we started to think. You know, there's a few basic principles it embedded in all this that need that need to be told. There's stories that need to be unravelled from complexity, basically, because yeah. finance really is designed. Uh, in a complex way, in order to make people feel like they need experts to help them out, it's kind of that, have that information asymmetry. Exactly. So that, like, but, exactly. Oh, okay, we know everything, so we're going to so take you, this back. You pay us a fee, and we'll sort it all out. You don't worry about it. But yeah. that's not the way it should be because it's your money. Mm-hmm. So we're trying. So that's started off us thinking about how you know empowering people a little bit more yeah. uh, with financial education. But those first few years were like a learning curve like that. But um, but we started to realize these things as we kind of went yeah. along. So, so your day to day was it? So, so you're managing investment portfolios. Early on, I was not. So okay. early, early on, so the Barclays graduate scheme that we did was rotation. So six to eight month rotation on a different team. Yeah. So spent time in a derivatives team. Spent time in Hong Kong in a team there. Um, spent time like a wealth structuring team. Mm-hmm. Uh, time advising like high net worth clients on the on the investments and other other, yeah. other finances. So that was like the two and a half three years I spent was in all these different little teams. So it gave me like broad exposure mm-hmm. of all areas of finance. And then I went and worked at Wellington Management. So that was like two and a half, three years in, I started to have this like uh, crisis of purpose of what I was doing. So yeah. I was learning a lot and that's great because I, do, I love learning. But what was my place in the world kind of thing? You know, what was the purpose to what I was doing? And what I became yeah. quite, I was wrestling with was I'm using all my energy and like uh, mind to do things that don't really seem that useful. Mm. You know, we were just shuffling money around and earning fees, but what's happening underneath in the real world? Wouldn't it be better if, you know, you could spend all your time and energy and divert all these resources to, like, something that was sort of addressing, like, climate change or housing and education, things like that. Yeah. So that I started to wrestle with those things in my mind, and I just thought, there's going to be no way that I can do this in finance, because all I'd known was that environment that I was yeah. in, which was very much, you know... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, profit-driven, revenue-driven, bonus-driven investment environment, mm-hmm. and that was clearly what you were doing. So this whole social and environmental angle that had come into my mind seemed so at odds with that world yeah. that I was like, you know, searching for jobs in another sector, and I didn't really, you know, completely outside of finance. Um, but you know, I chose to join Wellington Management, the uh, year, one of the biggest investment firms in the world, mm-hmm. um, and that was really like a short-term, one-year project to leave finance. So I was like, I'll, I'll join here, yeah. and then I'll figure it out. And then when I joined there, it was almost the first day, I met a guy in a lift. I don't know if I'll tell you the story, but obviously tell yeah. I'll tell everyone who's uh, listening. I met a guy in a lift on the top floor of the London offices, and um, his name's Eric Rice. And uh, <laughs> yeah. he, uh, he told me about this idea that he was working on. Um, for this investment fund Mm -hmm. and it was to beat the idea was you could beat the market every year in terms of returns okay everyone says that it's boring yeah but only by investing in companies that were outright addressing some social and environmental problem around the world Mm -hmm. and when he told me that it was like someone had told me what I was going to spend the next 30 years of my life working on I was like bang and I said it's instant so this is all in like floor seven to floor zero yeah and I'd convinced him to let me work on the idea with him in my spare time I wasn't hired to do that job I was hired to do a different job so he said to me, you know, we had a hard time finding um, affordable housing companies to invest in, so can you go and find me some affordable housing companies? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'll be, be fine. I got back to my desk and I was like, I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. So I just started Googling and speaking to my mates and then yeah. um, and that ended up in me like, kind of doing that as a day job, basically working mm-hmm. with him on that fund, investing money. You know, we invested yeah. in 50 companies around the world. There was, there was a team managing about a billion dollars um, by the time I left Wellington. Um, so I spent four years doing that there. Wow. And then so so during this time, you're managing managing these investments. You're finding more of that cause. Mm. What's your relationship like with Matt at this point? Your co-founder. Well, Matt and I are best friends. Um, we never. So Matt and I, when we started working at Barclays, we lived together for the first two months, and then we just went off in our different directions. So he was doing 
uh, rotations in Hong Kong and spending time in different teams. We were always in touch, and we, if we we're in the same place, we'd have a beer. Yeah, yeah. We'd we text, you know, every week or whatever, like mates do. You know, we were chatting with each other. There's another mate of ours, Dave, who was another Northern on the grad scheme. Mm-hmm. Um, the three of us, so the three of us kept in in good in good contact. Um, and th- so we, we were close friends. You know, was it his wedding, his stag do, all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so I joined Wellington in 2014. And then the te- Matt sent me a text message in September 2015, which was the first text message that gave rise to was the idea of us working on yeah. what became Ticker. Um, and it was really looking at, you know, there's no way for us to invest this way with our own money. We know our friends want to do it. It was a real hole in the market for mm-hmm. it. Why don't we kind of try and figure that out? Um, but you know. so, so the the blocker for investing your own money into it, what was that? Was it just you didn't have enough resources? You no, know, I mean I had the resources, yeah. but I mean it's just so inconvenient to. So what I was doing in the day job was there was fifty companies all around the world that we'd go and you know assess and invest in yeah. uh, for institutional investors like pension funds. Yeah. Um, but if I wanted to do that in my day job, first of all, most of the stocks um, aren't really available in, um, to invest in on most of the platforms on, on yeah. in the in the UK. For example, I had a Hargreaves Lansdowne account where I invested my own money. But if I wanted to go and do that, I'd go and buy, go and buy 50 different companies in my ISA. You know, uh, I've almost got to duplicate my day job. Yeah. But it, and who wants to do that, you know, the day job twice? Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I was like, wouldn't it be great if there was just an automated way that I could just go every month, mm. stick a couple of hundred quid or whatever into a portfolio that was roughly aligned with what I, what I believed in. Yeah. That, and, and, we, and we knew that if we felt like that, our peers at least would feel like it. And we spoke to them and everyone, everyone of our generation was like, yeah, if you created this, we would use it. So that was enough for us to start working on the idea. And then it became something slightly different when we started speaking um, to people that weren't in the industry. So of those 50 companies that we invested in, 10 of them were in India. And Eric and I went and visited a bunch of companies that we, that we invested in in India. And we went and met this housing company Mm. And they took us to this housing complex that they built, and um, we met some of the, the families in the homes. And this family explained to us how owning a home for the first time had this ripple effect on their lives. They had a kid, the kid had gone to school, all these positive things. Yeah. And I went home uh, to my parents, and I explained to them what I was doing in India. And they said to me it was the first time they'd ever understood what I did as a job mm. because they could under because it, it was framed in such a different way than all my other complex weird jobs yeah, that are yeah. just you know, full of words they don't understand. This seemed relatively simple and straightforward. And then we started to realize that the themes of impact investing, you know, you don't have to be in finance or uh, have invested before to understand or care about them, like climate change, housing, education, equality. Yeah. Everyone cares about one or more of them, especially our generation. So we started to think, is this the tool to bring people to invest that have never invested before because they understand it? Um, and that's what started to, you know, give rise to the design of the product, the look and feel of it, the mm-hmm. language that we use, who we started targeting as users. Um, because again, that's another tie into our frustrations with a lack of education as well, because a lot of investment products have been designed for people that have invested before, mainly designed, and I am one. I am, I am a white straight male, so yeah. they're designed by white straight males for white straight males. Yeah. They've never really been designed for anybody else. White straight males that have invested before, yeah. that is a very small number of people. Mm. So, it's like a financial inclusion issue because if people don't invest for their own future, they're actually screwing them, themselves over. Yeah. If you're aware of the gender investment gap, but the if a, if a woman and a man earn the same their entire lives, the man will always retire with money, more money because he'll invest more aggressively mm-hmm. during his, his life because of perceptions of risk and perceptions or even the design of products that have kept women out yeah, of investing. Yeah. But the same goes for anyone who invests and doesn't invest, not just gender. So mm. people that don't get educated on investing are missing out on the money they can have in retirement. Yeah. So how can we use this kind of investing, this way that it's framed, the narrative that people like to bring people to the table mm-hmm. and, and do them the future solves a favor? Okay, um, so we sort of cover the backstory now. I want yeah. to go into what was the early stages of mm. Ticker like? So when you <laughs> and Matt were working together, what was your first step? Like, do you go ahead and do you build the platform first? Do you, do you build the investment portfolio first? How, mm. how does everything work? Yeah, I mean, you don't know what you don't know until you start <laughs> digging around, believe me. Yeah. So, so we had that text message in September 2015, but it took us a while to get together, like a first name, a first pitch deck. Mm first idea of the product then we just started shopping it around a little bit you know we we, we had our careers in the industry so we knew some things but yeah. we didn't really know um, exactly the regulation you know custody of assets technology um, how we would market you know yeah. how we would you know KYC and identify customers that came mm-hmm. on the platform we had we didn't have any funding so 
there was a lot of things we needed to figure out. Which yeah. is why it took us like two to two and a bit years to get the get it to a point where we could leave our jobs. Yeah. But the main the main reason for obviously leaving our jobs was you, you're not you're not going to get anyone to invest and fund you if you've not left your job. Yeah. So the signaling effect. Yeah. You really like, believe? Are you it serious anyway? about this or not? Like you're so, crazy to leave this set career, which is like yeah. you're set. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean that was I mean that's a lot of conversation we had. So obviously yeah. you know. My mum worked the same job her whole life. My dad effectively did the same thing. Yeah. So the idea that... So when I moved from Barclays to Wellington, because they didn't know who Wellington was, they thought that was the biggest mistake I'd ever made. Then obviously yeah. they, they realised Wellington was a real company and it was yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. um, but then this was just the craziest thing I'd ever come up with. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of nerves about you know throwing your career away mm-hmm. and whatever. Um, but we only did it at a point where we developed quite a bit. The app was already being developed at this point. Yeah. So we'd, we'd self-funded some of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had... We'd, um, and then we were we knew we could get a few angel tickets, um, investments off the ground yeah. if we left our jobs. So on that, the, I remember the night before we did it, it was like the most nervous night of our lives. I was out for dinner, and I remember I just couldn't concentrate at dinner. Yeah. It was a bunch of people I was with, and I uh, I got off the table, and I'm going to have to ring Matt. And just <laughs> 9 p.m. on a Sunday night, I was like, this is definitely a good idea, isn't it? It's so good. <laughs> and then I couldn't sleep that night, and I yeah. went into work at like 6 a.m. I was just sat at my desk waiting for my manager to come in and uh, be like... I need to tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then after that moment, mm-hmm. it's amazing what you can achieve when you're fully focused on things. So yeah. anyone who's scrapping around in, in, on the side of the desk trying to get an idea off the ground, obviously you get it to a point that you're comfortable with. Yeah. But then you've got to go for it if you think the idea is a strong idea. Yeah. Because you you, you, <laughs> you're, you don't know what your ability to work is like when your life is basically on the line. Mm-hmm. So we, we had to raise money that somewhere else we were dead. Mm-hmm. Um Luckily, we did that, but it took hundreds of meetings to do it. Pounding yeah. across London in what was a heat wave in summer 2018. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, we got that, over, got that money over the line. Then we, we were already developing the product. We were bringing in third parties in the mm-hmm. background for custody of assets and everything like that. And it's still just you and Matt. It's still just me and Matt. Um, and it was me and Matt till, you know, till late in the summer, so August, September. This year? Uh, no, in, um, oh, in 2018. 2018. Yeah. Let's kind of talk you through that the, mm-hmm. the journey, and then we in October two thousand eighteen we started running a very scrappy like beta trial with family and friends, mm-hmm. um, and we ran that for a few months. But there was so many, you know, so much wrong with the product. But, yeah, um, we knew there was so much wrong. We just wanted to test that some of the functionality worked, mm-hmm. and it roughly did. And we were improving it the whole time, working with the people on the beta trial, and getting it to a point where we felt like we could put it in the app store. Uh, we didn't do any big bang launch. We don't believe in that kind of thing. We just mm-hmm. put it in the App Store in January 2019, at which point there was four people in the team. Yeah. Um, and then we put the Android version out there in February. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then, um, and now, you know, tens of thousands of people in the product, 14 of us in the team um, in, what, we're in November now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 10 months later. So, what was it like hiring your first employee? It was exceptionally difficult because who in the right mind would want to come and work for us when all we, all, we, all there is is a lad from Wigan and a lad from Liverpool with a, with a presentation. Yeah. Um, there's no product yeah. you can see. Um, you, you just basically had our CVs, a little bit of funding, and uh, a belief in the idea. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, we managed to get some, but some people in, uh, to back up a second. We were we were kind of open to the idea of doing the business fully in the northwest. Mm-hmm. We have a London office and a Liverpool, and a Liverpool office. Yes. Yeah. Matt and I are both in the northwest. But just the availability of talent here is more pronounced because the talent mm. is more it is deeper. But obviously, there's a startup community as well, so people are more used to taking risks and working for startups. That doesn't really exist in the Northwest yet. Yeah. Um, so those first few employees were kind of risk takers. You know, Karishma, who sat in the back, you know, just brand and design and basically everything created for the company. Mm-hmm. She, <laughs> amazing looking back, but she done is in uh, October, I would say, 2018. She was one of the four in January. Yeah. Um, and. Um, she left a job where she was working for Warner Brothers, doing like a, doing a creative role for Warner, Warner Brothers mm-hmm. in design. And um, she came for us, to us, and we and I remember sitting with her on the first day. I was like, "We haven't actually agreed what you're going to get in paid." She was like, I, "I don't care about getting paid. I know I'll get paid at some point." And um, that's some dedication. Oh, I mean, amazing. She just just quit a job completely, turned up, was like, "What needs to be done? I'll do these things." Yeah. And then obviously a role got shaken out for her in time and she obviously can use the skills that she's from a brand in fashion design background so yeah. that's what she does here um, but I just remember that you know that just the, the bravery the risk taking of yeah. doing that and you know eternally grateful for those people but then obviously as we progress we started doing more um, we get a little bit bigger mm-hmm. you know we do a little start doing a little bit of marketing when Rob Baldwin joined us people then start learning about us 
and then they see us on the news or they see us uh, it's much yeah. easier to hire people when you know yeah. if, and you go through another funding round and da, 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 da. so it becomes a lot easier in time and now we get people coming to us all the time trying to you know working for us uh, that was not the case at the mm-hmm. beginning it was a uh, it was tough you know it was a uh, because basically my job I do sales basically. So hiring is sales. Yeah. Fundraising is sales and marketing and PR is yeah. sales. That's basically what I do. So do you feel like right now you're kind of at that <coughs> pinnacle just before you you're expecting kind of explosive growth? I hope so. Um, well, of, of course, but like you've kind of been on the, the very yeah. early stage. Okay, we need to actually get funding, get get a team put together. And now you're kind of at the stage, okay, we've got tens of thousands of users now. Mm-hmm. Now we want to explode this thing. Yeah, I mean, my, our ambitions are huge. You know, we want millions of users uh, in 2024. The original five-year projection was that, in, and it'd be a European-wide business. Mm-hmm. The stages to get there. We're on track with our growth, but the growth accelerates, mm-hmm. obviously. So everything we've done so far is at, is at least expected. Um, you know, we're quietly dissatisfied with everything that we've done, well, and quietly, you know, proud at the same time. It's yeah. hard, but when you're on the inside and in the weeds, it's hard to see that moment coming. Yeah. But people externally do say that thing to us Mm -hmm. Um, but the whole thing was built from the beginning to be a scale a big scale business the first fully scaled investment app in in Europe there's a couple in the US we want to do it in Europe Mm -hmm. Um, so we're ready for it it's just it it will feel like an eternity to us but you know like all people who've never heard of of, let's say Revolut who have downloaded it like this week and it's a a user 7 million but for them it would have felt like an eternity to get to that point if we can get 7 million users in 5 years that'll be fine that's the goal but yeah it's hard you know you can never predict when you're at that Mm -hmm. moment but I think you know growth is growth is good Mm -hmm. you came to an event the other night you see the people in the room Um, so I think you know we're we're not we're not far away from, from, from it being at that level and I have to ask, but so we'll, we'll dive into what the actual product yeah. does in a second. But I have to ask, firstly, what's what's been the toughest thing for you personally on this journey, and ha- and how have you bounced back from that? Toughest thing for has, me. Has there been a moment that you can think in your mind which is like that really stuck out? I don't know the specific moment. Firing the first person was horrible. Mm. Um, that was horrible. Yeah, I, I had dreams about it in the build up. I dream. I had st- occasionally yeah. I've dreamed about it since. Um, uh, you know, it was for the benefit of the business, and I think for the benefit of the individual as well, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, it was, you know, that was one of the worst yeah. moments of my life, I would say. And was that just like a misalignment of what you? Yeah, it was a misal- It was a misalignment. We needed a specific thing at the time, and um, a great individual. Mm-hmm. Um, so nothing, nothing against you know, yeah. the individual or whatever. But that was a, that was tough. But Matt and I have this thing. Well, actually, Dave, our third friend, came up with the. He has his own startup unrelated yeah. to ours. And he calls it good hour, bad hour. And um, it's actually like good minute, bad minute. So yeah. you get an email, amazing news. You'll get another email, terrible news. And it's just like that yeah. all times. So you have to get used to just the uncertainty. Um, I mean, you have to manage yourself because of that. So every single time you do something amazing, I never really focus on it. Mm-hmm. And every single time something terrible happens, um, I yeah. know that it'll come back. So you kind of just have to get used to that ebb and flow of it. Like yeah. a ro- it's like a roller coaster ride that you got on that you don't know when it ends mm-hmm. and it's dark and people are throwing water over you and that kind of thing. But um, you just have to be faithful, like your investment side of things. It will smooth over yeah, time. Like. Yeah. So I mean, that was the specific hardest moment. But generally yeah. speaking, it's been um, it, the, the, there's ups and downs with it. The the greatest gift of it all is uh, having being in it with one of your best friends. Yeah. So when he's um, feeling something I'm not, so we can mm-hmm. we can bring it, we can pull each other up. We have some, we can share everything with each other, and yeah. you know, we have a great working. We've translated a great friendship into a great working relationship, which it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, I don't right. think we've been very lucky in that regard. We've grown kind of together, mm-hmm. um, so that's been the the way we've dealt with it. It's just having each other, and we've got an amazing set of advisors that help us out who've yeah. been through this journey, you know, many times over, and mm-hmm. they've got you know the thirty years older than us or whatever. So it's always little pearls of wisdom that they have that kind of uh, help you out. That's awesome. So let's dive into the product quickly. Yep. I'll put a, a screen recording of it, and yeah, like okay. the product itself looks beautiful. Like the UI UX Thank of you. it is is really nice, and yeah. so I can imagine like a lot of people like my generation are looking at it and go, oh, "It's so easy to use." Yeah. It's not if you download. I've downloaded some other brokerage apps before, and things like it's like yeah. horribly ugly. Like so yeah, many yeah. things, I don't know yeah. where to go. But it's very simple. Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of reminded me, like, so they have the risk levels as well mm. in the investment portfolios. I think uh, I've looked at Nutmeg before. They do a yep. similar kind of thing. Yep. Um, but obviously, wh- why don't we talk about how the product's used? Yeah. Um, and also, what differentiates you from all the other yeah. investment apps? Yeah, so 
the product is is designed to be relatively easy to mm-hmm. use because it's designed for, as we said before, first time investors. So it's a two minute sign up process. Most people complete it in two minutes, um, and you select a theme that resonates with you the most. Mm-hmm. Like say, climate change is one of the most popular themes. Then you select a risk level, high, medium, and low. And in the background, you have hundreds of companies around the world that are linked to the theme that you've selected, mm-hmm. and you can start investing from five pounds. Most and again, people. relates back to your job. Did you personally look at look into these companies, made sure that they were approaching that sort of social cause? Exactly. So yep. we 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 use all the tools that we learned in our previous jobs, mm-hmm. um, and kind of bring it. The idea is that we bring what we were doing there, and you know, create a simplified user experience around what is still in the background, like mm-hmm. solid investment management. You know, you don't need to understand how an electric car battery works to drive a Tesla. Yeah. But you have an amazing, you know, interface and amazing experience. That's what we're trying to create with this product. Yeah. So in the background, if you're a financial services professional, you can look under the hood and go, "Oh, that this stacks up." Yeah. But on the surface, it's just like beautiful, seamless user experience. That's mm-hmm. kind of what we're going for. Um, so in the background, yeah, there's hundreds of companies um, that um, that are addressing the theme that you've uh, selected. Yeah. And in the app, you can dig into those companies, find out what they're doing around the world, and we're just about to start sending more like financial education and more impact stories. So the the stories of the companies and the good stuff that they're doing around the mm-hmm. world. And the idea is that you actually engage with your investments for a different reason. Mm-hmm. You're engaging with them and you bought into them for the for what they're doing around the world. And in the background, your money's stacking up and earning returns for you over time. Yeah. So I'd say how it compares to other people is we're, we're one of the only ones in the world at the moment. There'll be many more in the future to focus purely on this way of investing. Mm-hmm. Some people do it as an add-on. But anything that's an add-on is always done in a slightly weaker way and doesn't get the full attention of the company. I don't think it ever does. And the engagement that we get because of it it being the only thing that we do is just more enhanced and more more pronounced than other companies because Mm -hmm. um, it's the sole focus of what we do. Then all the engagement, the storytelling, that that story that I told you about going to India and telling my parents about it, how do we give the user that experience? That's the goal. How do we connect the user from their money to, to how it's being you know, used around the world mm-hmm. by the companies that, that, that we're investing in and the good stuff that they're doing. And you've got those two and then you've got the third part which is I'm making money from it. Exactly. <laughs> so that's the thing, the beautiful part of this way of investing is, and it's worth kind of mentioning this for a minute, there's like ethical, socially responsible investing which is one specific thing. Mm-hmm. Impact investing is not that. We're actually going to do a video uh, I think called We Are Not Ethical. It's not because we're proud to not be an ethical business. Give it a clickbait. We are an ethical business. <laughs> but yeah, but ethical investing is a specific thing and what ethical mm-hmm. investing is is screening out negative companies like tobacco companies or arms companies because you don't want to invest in them yeah. but it's not what impact investing is impact investing is basically screening in good companies mm-hmm. a lot of the, a lot of the investments in um, ethical portfolios like Coca-Cola and HSBC but they're not addressing any kind of world problem they're just mm-hmm. not they're just well run and have yeah. you know sc- they score well on certain metrics, mm-hmm. but they would never be in an impact investment portfolio. Um, we have you know companies that are doing specific things around the world that you would look at and go, okay, yeah, I get that tip. Yeah, yeah. So that's how it's that's how it's different. Um, mm-hmm. And again, again, just the market that we're going for. If you look at more of the generic digital investment managers, the robo advisors, yeah, their average user tends to be like a fifty-year-old white male mm-hmm. with a twenty thousand pound one-time balance. That is not who our user is. Mm-hmm. Average age is thirty-one. It's forty percent um, female. The the user base. Eighty um, percent have never invested before, and they're investing about one hundred twenty quid a month every mm-hmm. month with us. So they're growing with us over time. So it's got a totally different demographic, and most of our users have never heard of any of the composition. Yeah. Um, so it's just we're trying I feel to feel like you're capturing a whole new market. Opening a new yeah. market is what we always thought we could do with this, and mm-hmm. it's kind of proving out slowly. It's really cool. And I don't want to go on for, for too much longer. I have, <laughs> ca- have one more main question, then we'll do yeah. some quick fire questions. Go for it. Um, main question is, so what what are your personal goals and how do how does Tom want to be remembered? <laughs> what kind of work did... Yeah. As long as my mum's proud of me, that's all I'll go about. Uh, I... So in your personal life as well, yeah. you have personal goals for yourself that you want to... I always have personal goals, yeah. but they all, they all tend to not be related to ticker. Yeah. Um, the ticker goals are goals that we've come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, I always have like personal... Um, crazy little goals that I have. So I am man as one. I'm yeah. like, I've started boxing recently, so awesome. I want to do a boxing match. Yeah. At some point, I'll do a powerlifting competition. Those mm-hmm. kind of things. They're all totally separate. Yeah. I always like having a very separate goal to my career, mm-hmm. so I can focus on something else as yeah. well. So and you know, played a lot of football and uh, other sports growing up. So I need to replace that energy and do it and channel it somewhere else. Yeah. So I always have a very specific sport goal um, at any one time in mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it helps me focus on something else, which helps me then recharge for work. I think. Yeah. Um, but the ticker goals are all are all. I mean, I want to work in impact investing for my whole life. Mm-hmm. That'll be at ticker. 
And if for some reason uh, Ticker no longer needs me at some point in time, I'll still do impact investing. Yeah, it's what I actually personally care and about. You it's like go and directly do it. As yeah, well, it's, the, yeah. It, it's the crusade that I've kind of signed up to. Is that it, it's it's what I will do with my whole career. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I'm the kind of person that will probably never stop working. Yeah, even if I even if I could stop, I wouldn't. Um, I enjoy it. So um, for Ticker, the goal for us as a business is to be, you know, I, I think I maybe mentioned this the other night, but. You know, co- um, the most prized commodity of our generation is convenience. Mm-hmm. It's why we all order off Amazon every day, even though we're aware how the warehouse conditions of the workers at Amazon. So, how do we create a company mm-hmm. that is as convenient, but um, you have a positive impact at the same time? So that's what we're trying to achieve as yeah. a business. Investing is the beginning because Matt and I met in an investment context, and we understand that world. Mm-hmm. What we actually care about is like positive impact and positive business. So, if we'd met at culinary college we'd be doing an impact bakery <laughs> so yeah. yeah we that gives us room to kind of maneuver and if we can create like positive impact finance mm-hmm. that's what we're kind of trying to create as a business awesome right we're going to do some quick fire questions Go for that. um okay so first one i've got is uh who's the biggest person that's influenced you does it have to be outside of my family not at all is that, is that um I'll have to. I'll, I'll do two because I, I ask this as an interview question, yeah. and when people say the mum and dad, I always say that's a cop out. Give me someone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, my mum, da- mum and dad really give me like a really gave me a mm-hmm. un- unbelievable hard workers and so consistent with it. They're very dedicated people. Yeah. So that gave me like an amazing foundation to be able to do all the other things that I could do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my first boss, uh, my English teacher that I mentioned, uh, yeah. Mr. Wright. My first boss at Barclays, Karan Seshpal, and then Eric Rice, who I met in the lift. Awesome. And then people that I've never met, I would say, is, this is like a white male tech cliche, is Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah, he inspires me. When I read his uh, biography mm-hmm. by Ashley Vance, it kind of changed yeah. my perception of risk. I haven't read it, but it's on my... It's on my yeah, it changed my whole perception of risk-taking. Um, and actually made me think that if we didn't do this, that is riskier than mm. than um, than doing it itself. Yeah. So, is that, that the risk of when you're 50, 60, yeah, 70? I mean, what's, what, what have you got to lose? I mean, especially Matt and me. Like, we, we had careers in finance, we had networks. That if we did... You know, I was you know 30, 29, 30 when we when we started it. Mm-hmm. Um, no kids, no mortgage, no nothing. If I couldn't do it, then who could? Yeah, you know. So that kind of tipped me over the edge. Cool. Uh, I think we discussed this earlier, but favorite music artist? <laughs> well, it's controversial. <laughs> these. It didn't used to be controversial saying this, but it's Kanye West. Kanye West. <laughs> it could be president soon. Hope so. No, no, I, actually, I actually don't. I just wanted to do hip hop music. <laughs> nothing else. Um, if you could speak to three people, dead or alive. Ooh, that is amazing. Mm-hmm. Dead or alive? Um, I've just read the uh, Amazon book as well. So mm-hmm. I didn't realise what kind of guy Jeff Bezos was. I'd like to speak to Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Um, I would like to speak to... Uh, <laughs> these, are all, these are great questions. Um, Barack Obama. Yeah. I thought he was not a perfect guy, but... As an orator and as a as a leader, as a thoughtful person, I, I mm-hmm. think he's a shining example of a of a modern politician. Yeah. Um, and then I would try and I would speak to Greta Thunberg actually, mm-hmm. not just because I'm I'm a, I'm a mad climate activist. I'm actually yeah. not, but how she's mobilised the movement from nothing. I yeah. think he's like genius, and I'd love to know how, from from an operational point of view and from a uh, an actual logistical point of view, she mm-hmm. managed to get do that and yeah. actually work with people to do it. I think it's whether you agree with the issue or not. The mobilisation of the sheer number of people for the issue I mean, is she's amazing. She's got behind her. Yeah. Um, it's it, you know it's just crazy. So I'd like to have that conversation. Cool. Uh, short or long Bitcoin? Um, long. I do own Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I have done for a while. I've rode yeah. the wave down and up and down again. <laughs> this isn't investment advice. This by is the way. not. This is not. <laughs> don't act on it. I mean, I'm probably doing what I would say you should not do and just holding it because I've lost money on it and yeah. I need to come back. But, um, whether it's whether well. it's a good idea or not, and I hold, own a bunch of. Them. I, I I became obsessed. I've got a Bitcoin story for you. If we've got yeah. a little bit no, time. go for so it. Yeah. I um in 2012 when I worked in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. my mate Sam Tomlinson came over to me at the side of my desk on a Friday night and he was like, you know, instead of just going and blowing all our money tonight in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong as we keep doing yeah. every Friday night, why don't we put $100 each in, in Bitcoin? I was like, mm-hmm. what the hell's Bitcoin? He tried to explain it to me. I, I had no hope in hell's uh, um, uh, idea of understanding what it was at that yeah. time. You know, it was like 23 or whatever. So we didn't, we didn't, and Bitcoin at the time was $5 per Bitcoin. Yeah. So we would have had, you know, 20 Bitcoin. And um, then we didn't do it. And then it went to a thousand dollars in two thousand and thirteen, fourteen, something yeah. like that. 
Um, at which point, obviously regretted not buying it. I bought it at that point, and then it went up and I sold a bit, and it went down again. But if I'd, if we'd have bought the the beginning point and then held to what 2018 yeah. when it went crazy, we'd have, we'd have been millionaires, but we did not. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, it was, after that conversation, I did become obsessed with it, and I read everything I could. Mm. Really trying to understand the what was going on in the background, the actual detail, the yeah. cryptography, and uh, and everything that went into the mining process. Mm. So I, I did understand it at a granular level, yeah. but I still didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was too late to the party, probably. Okay, next one is Netflix or read? At the moment, it's Netflix. I used to read ferociously, but I... Um, I listen to a lot of audio, audio books now and podcasts. Yeah. Well, that's that's the next question: audio book or real book? Real book? Uh, it used to be real book. Now it's audio book because I walk. I have half an hour walk to work, and I've mm-hmm. just moved out of the office, so I just listen to books. Um, I don't. Have, I don't have the. When I, when I used to read a lot is when I used to have a forty-five minute com, uh, minute commute to work. Yeah, and I would read like a book a week. Um, I would just fly through books. Yeah, um, but it's like the situation. I can't actually do that now, yeah. so I have to listen to audio books. But I, pr- I probably would prefer real books. Yeah, um, if I had the setting to mm. to do it. Uh, winter or summer? Winter. Nice. Yeah. And last question: If you could recommend one book to anyone listening, I would recommend uh, Ben Horowitz's uh, "The Hard Things About Hard Things." Read it. It's, it's, it's probably good. one of the best books I've ever read. Yeah. About the reality find- of mm. what it's like to try and run a company. Obviously, he ran a company and sold it for billions. Yeah. But um, but it was a very like warts and all tale mm. of of the reality. I think. Do you find yourself coming back to that book ever? Yeah, actually, it, it was one of the it was one of the only books that I've read because a lot of like entrepreneurial. Businessy books that are like you read the first page and you can do with not reading the rest of the book. It's like <laughs> yeah. repetition and you get it. But that was like a proper journey through, mm-hmm. you know, how to deal with certain situations and 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 uh, proper it was stories. Like, it was proper stories. Yeah. It was like a meeting that we have with our advisors. Like, okay, this is normal. Like, mm-hmm. this is what we're meant to be going through. Yeah, and it gives you a, a bit of strength and a bit of a framework to think about things. Um, so yeah, as a practical book for like entrepreneurialism and what it's like running a business, I would read that. Awesome, Tom. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Cool.